I discovered this week's guest about seven years ago on The Tim Ferriss Show. His name is Derek Sivers, and he's the author of four excellent short books that I would almost classify as philosophy for creatives. But before Derek was an author, he was a musician, a circus performer, and the founder of CD Baby, the largest seller of independent music online with over $100 million in sales for more than 150,000 musicians. You know, CD Baby, even when I started CD Baby in 1997, I was just trying to help my friends sell their music online. But then that became like an unsolved problem of how to help them do it better. So then for the next 10 years, it was like 7 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week for 10 years. I did nothing but just work on CD Baby. You couldn't get me to go to a restaurant or take a vacation or anything like that. All I wanted was to solve this problem. I just get very head down. Derek gets so heads down on one project at a time that he actually calls himself a monomaniac. And being so heads down on CD Baby turned out to be a great idea because after 10 years of running the company, Derek was able to sell CD Baby for $22 million. And since that time, Derek has been working on one creative project at a time, usually in the form of books. Most recently, he published How to Live, 27 Conflicting Answers and One Weird Conclusion. He says it was inspired by a book called Some, 40 Tales from the Afterlife by David Eagleman. About two years after reading it, I read it a second time. And a month later, I was driving down the road and just went like, oh, my God, I need to write a book called How to Live in the same format as Some, but answering the question, how should you live? Like, in 40 different ways, and each of them will be conflicting. Oh my God, what a beautiful idea, because how cool for one book to disagree with self, because that's what life is really like. Derek is a fascinating person, a deep thinker, and I think you'll really enjoy this change of pace from our typical interviews on this show. We talk about how Derek is able to focus on one project at a time, how to navigate conflicting philosophies, what we can learn from professional musicians, and how creators like you and I can pursue balance in our lives. I'd love to hear your thoughts as you listen. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram at jklaus. Tag me. Let me know that you're listening. And if you're here on YouTube, leave a comment. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. But that's enough for me. Let's dive in. Let's talk with Derek. It's always been my nature to dive into one thing at a time because it feels like an unsolved problem. Right. And mm. I and I need to solve this problem. And I just lose interest in other things until this problem is solved. I think I've always been that way. You know, when I was 14 years old and started playing guitar, I wanted to get so good at guitar that I could play those guitar solos that I love. And that was an unsolved problem. And it was like, you know, it's eight hours a day for the next, I don't know, eight years. I was just head down doing finger exercises and picking exercises and arpeggios and scales to try to solve that problem of uh, getting as good at guitar as I wanted to be. Now, people often call me a workaholic, but I say that nobody called me a workaholic when I was playing guitar. (laughs) We tend to have certain ideas of what we can call work and what we can't, but everything I'm doing now is no different than playing guitar when I was 14 years old. It's just diving into whatever is interesting me the most at this time. Uh, But if, you know, your fingers are on a computer, it looks like work and we call it work. But it's really just play to me. And then every now and then it happens in life when I feel that something's done and solved. And then I lift my head up and I have some uh, times of diffused freedom where I'm looking for something else to be interested in. Do you think that's in an, an innate ability and interest or can that be learned because i feel like that's a discipline that a lot of us need some help with is to say one problem one focus one open loop let's close that Mm. loop let's solve that thing yeah i realize i could sound uh despicable right now like those people who say like oh i always just eat healthy i eat nothing but vegetables you know (laughs) we're like ah shut up (laughs) you're of no (laughs) use to me you're nothing like me no but i think i do have many 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 interests But I've learned the hard way that you have to focus on one at a time to get it done. And then you can use time to get the others done. Like, you know, you you might have heard I have this 
little slogan about don't be a donkey. Yes, this is my next question. I'm so glad you're tying this in. <laughs> Great. I prompted your next question. I love that. Um, Buridan's Donkey is a story of a donkey that is exactly halfway in between food and water, a pile of hay and a trough of water, exactly halfway in between. It keeps looking at the food and looking at the water going, oh, I'm hungry and thirsty, but can't decide and eventually dies. The idea is like, don't be Buridan's donkey. Use time. You're wise enough to know that you can go to the pile of hay and eat your hay first. And don't worry, you'll get to the water later. You can use time. It exists. We have foresight. We're humans. We have imagination. It's kind of our unique capability in this world. So I think of that with all the things I wanted to do. Of course, they're all in there. And of course, I want to do many things. But I've just learned the hard way, like Buridan's donkey, that you have to do one first and complete it and then go do the uh, the next thing. And I think it's probably just in my value system, right? Because we've seen it with other things. There were times in my life where I said I wanted to lose weight, but didn't. And then there were just two times in my life that were like, no, I really need to lose weight now. And all it is, is I just made it my top priority. You know, I put myself through some discomfort and said, no, I, this has just been bumped up my priority list. This is now priority number one. And when people ask me later, like, oh, wow, how did you lose 40 pounds or something? There was no other trick to it. It's the same stuff we all know. It's just that I just made it my top priority. And until you do that, nothing happens. So I think it's the same thing with my work. Of course, I'm interested in many things, but I just, I've learned that if I just make something the top priority and do only that thing, let everything else fall aside, it'll actually get done. But if I don't do it, it won't. What's the saying? If if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority, I think. Yeah. This is this is such a common problem I see with creatives today because we are torn in all these different directions where we're saying, okay, well, I really want to focus on email. And then, oh, well, my friend is starting to do YouTube. And now I think I want to go over there. And if I'm doing YouTube, I might as well be uploading to TikTok as well. <laughs> and we become this donkey pulled between not even just two directions, but six different directions. So yeah. it's 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 a muscle I've been trying to build recently as well is to take sequencing very seriously and prioritization and say prioritization is the precursor to sequencing. When I say this is a priority, that's all I'm focusing on right now, followed by this thing, followed by this thing. So it's, mm. a, it's a very timely conversation to have in, in my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what might help? I journal a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, sometimes hours a day, at least an hour a day, sometimes three or four hours a day. When I get really excited about something else I want to do, I go describe that project in great detail. I open up a new, like I make a new folder for me to keep things related to that project in that folder. And I just start dumping all my ideas, specific plans. If you know, I'm also a programmer, so I'll start to make the database schema, how this is going to work, even start to code some things, write down how I'm going to execute this, how I'm going to hire people, what are the implications, what are some other ideas I could toss into this, and I'll just do this massive brain dump and put it all in that folder, and I know it's recorded, and in a way that kind of gives me some peace. You know, it's like, well, <sighs> all right, there, that's six hours of ideas around that. Now I need to get back to finishing the one I'm working on. Because when I say project, I'm, I'm, it might be a week-long project, but sometimes it can be like four years long. Like my mm. newest book took four years to write. And of course, other things came up in four years. But I would do that kind of thing where I'd, I have a, a meta folder called Possible Futures that are things I might possibly do in the future. And inside that are, you know, 100, 200 subfolders of all these different projects that I might do someday that I've had ideas for described in great detail. And I think something about doing that brain dump and putting it into a uh, text file, recording it somewhere, lets your soul be a little bit at peace to know that, all right, I've saved all my ideas around that. Now let me get back to the thing that's unfinished so I can finish it so I can move on. This is a good segue because I do want to talk about uh, the book a little bit, How to Live. A very um, thought-provoking, sometimes even frustrating book in a way that like creates positive tension is the way I want to I want to frame that because cool. you you introduce these these ideas that are seemingly at odds or explicitly at odds in a lot of ways. You speak about you know all even if things seem to be counterintuitive or at odds. They can still both be true. So as you're talking about multiple futures and you're writing this book where it has these 27 conflicting viewpoints, 
How do you hold space within yourself to believe multiple truths when they seem at odds? It's the unanswerable question. The, the big idea with my book, How to Live, is that life is not a problem to be solved, but it's a paradox to be experienced. And I think it's funny how all of these nonfiction books your listeners have read and I've read and you've read often act like they've got the answer to the problem. Like this, this is the solution to the problem in your life. And after you've read so many of them, it becomes kind of comical. This book will tell you that this is the answer, but that book will tell you that is the answer. And they're completely conflicting. And yet in their own world, they're both true. So how do we reconcile this? That question was the inspiration for the book called How to Live. It's an homage to a book called Some by David Eagleman, spelled S-U-M, which is probably my single favorite book of all time. And I love its format. What I love about the book Sum, it's called, it's Sum, its subtitles is 40 Tales from the Afterlives. And it's a short little fiction book where each of the 40 chapters is just two or three pages long and answers the question, what happens when you die? So it's like one chapter says, when you die, you're a, you, you wake up in this giant mansion and you walk around for a long time until you figure out that uh, we're all alone in the universe. And the next chapter will say, when you die, you're greeted by somebody who told you in the last life you chose to be a human, but uh, you always get to choose what creature you'd like to be. So this time you decide you want to be a horse. And another chapter will say, when you die, you wake up and find out that you were an artificial intelligence program written by these creatures that are too stupid to understand what you've learned <laughs> in your lifetime. So I love this format that it's taking one question, like what happens when you die, and inside one book, answering it 40 different conflicting ways. It was such a beautiful format. I love that. It's so inspiring because the unspoken idea between all that is like there is no one answer like, life is not a problem to be solved. It's a paradox to be experienced. I mean, God, look, you've done over 100 and something episodes of your podcast now. You must have heard so many conflicting answers oh, yeah. to the All question the of, hey, what, what should your listeners do? <laughs> no, here's what your listeners should do. And I love that. Like, that's the paradox of life. And so I wanted to capture that paradox in one book. And, and I'm really proud of it. I think I did it. So when you had that moment of insight of I should write this book, how to live, how did that escape the possible futures folder and Ooh. become a problem that you said, this is the problem now? At first, it was yet another possible future. And then I think like a month had gone by and I couldn't stop obsessing Mm -hmm. about this idea. Like that folder called How to Live, I just kept putting more and more and more and more ideas into it every day. I just kept thinking about this idea and I couldn't stop. And I was like, all right, I think I need to do this. Like, this is the best idea I've had in a long time. I am so excited about this. I'm more excited about this than everything else. So, God, that's a good question. I don't even remember what I might have been in the middle of four years ago when I started it. Now, five years ago. Whatever it was, I finished it up quickly so that I could work on How to Live. And in fact... You know, my other books, so now I've got four of these little things. Anything you want, Your Music and People, Hell Yeah or No, How to Live. The problem was Your Music and People and Hell Yeah or No were unfinished books that I was still in the process of putting out. It was important for me to put them out sequentially. It would have felt wrong mm. to put out How to Live before the books that were mostly finished. So I did actually make myself pause my inspiration, my, my drive to finish How to Live. I made myself pause it to put out Your Music and People and then put out Hell Yeah or No. I think any of us who have an idea, we should write them all down, keep them in your possible futures folders, save all your ideas. But then every now and then, just very rarely, you'll just get so driven and obsessed by one idea. And I think that's how you know it's a good idea, is if it makes you jump into action in the present moment. It's a, it's a really good combination of both following your excitement, but also exercising com some constraint. Because if you, I'm thinking for myself here, if I were to say, you know what, the new process is when I have an idea, I capture it. But all ideas by default are someday maybe possible futures ideas. And it's the act of 
not being able to stop thinking about the idea that kind of raises it above the threshold to where it becomes a, a hell yes and becomes the thing. I have a friend of mine who had a problem with impulse buys for a while. And so he created a process for himself where if he wanted to buy something, he opened it up in a Chrome tab, set it there for three days. And if three days pass and he didn't close the tab and he still wanted that thing, then he bought it. And he said nice. almost all of them went away at that point. So there is something about <laughs> uh, having enough restraint, restraint to say, I recognize there's excitement here. Is this enduring excitement? Should I wait to commit for this to mm. prove itself to be above the rest? Yeah, maybe that's kind of the nice side effect of the monomaniac approach is that all these other ideas you have, you're saying, you're not saying no, you're saying maybe later to all of them. You, you could jot it down, put it in your futures folder, save your notes on it, brain dump your ideas, but everything is a maybe later until you finish what you're working on now. And that maybe later itself is a good filter because some of them come back and some of them won't go away. And maybe that's how you know it's a, an idea worth paying attention to if it won't go away. After a quick break, Derek and I talk about how he manages 27 conflicting philosophies in his life. And later we talk about how we can pursue balance and stability as creators. So stick around. We'll be right back. If you like creative elements, you would love my weekly newsletter, Creator Science. I send it every Sunday and it breaks down everything I'm learning about how to be a professional creator. It expands on the things we talk about here on this show, and it even goes behind the scenes of my own business and shows you what I'm doing, what I'm experimenting with in my own journey. If you're serious about this, I think it is a must read. More than 14,000 creators already subscribe. So if you are not already subscribed, go to creatorscience.com and subscribe for free, and I'll talk to you on Sunday. Welcome back to my conversation with Derek Sivers. With 27 different and often conflicting views on how we can live our life, I asked Derek how he personally navigates those different philosophies and when he chooses to change direction or find a new season within his own life. I have to spoil the ending of the book a little bit to talk about this, but at the end of the book, there's a picture of an orchestra or like a diagram of an, the orchestra seating chart. The reason I did that is because to me, it's kind of the answer to this, is if you could imagine yourself in front of an orchestra, and now you are the composer and conductor, and you've got, let's say, 27 different instruments at your <laughs> disposal to, to do what you want with. Think of some of the questions you're asking through that metaphor. Like, well, how do you choose? Are you going to use the flute for a couple years, or are you going to use the viola for a couple years? Well, the answer is you don't have to decide. You combine them. You can say, okay, I'm going to have the flute and viola playing for a bit. And then it might just be a few seconds, and then they can stop. And now it's just the harp. And then boom, 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 you bring in everybody for a little bit. And then, So if you apply that to your life, then... As you're listening to podcasts like this and people telling you, you should do this, no, 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 you should do that, you can apply these different approaches at the micro-nuanced level to certain aspects of your life. Like, you might do what the book Atomic Habits says, but only half an hour a day, and then throw yourself completely into one thing for four hours, and you might live for the future for an hour, but then during lunchtime, you're an absolute hedonist and you indulge in whatever the hell you feel like eating for lunch today. And then after lunch, you do something to keep your past work alive. So you're kind of living for the past, you're leaving a legacy, or even just the way that you apply different approaches to life. It might not even be time-based. It might be in certain aspects of life, right? Like say, when it comes to technology, I'm actually very conservative. I really like using technologies that have been around for decades. Those are the ones that are most likely to be around for more decades. So I find those most worth the investment of my time. I don't invest any time into technologies that are brand new because those are the ones that are the least likely to last. And so I value my time so highly that I'm very conservative with where I invest my time into technologies, right? But then when it comes to life decisions, like where to live, well, then I'll just up and like move across the world at the drop of a hat just because like, hey, that sounds fun. That's a challenge and I'll go. So you can take certain philosophies and apply them to certain aspects of your life. You don't have to pick one and say, this one is right and that one's wrong. You just say in a more nuanced way, like, well, for this or 
in my relationship with my kid, I take this approach. But in my relationship with my mm. colleagues at work, I take that approach. You don't have to say which is right, which is wrong, which do you believe in. The truth is always so much more nuanced than that. This is a tough question. So if nothing comes immediately to mind, we can just move on. But I'm curious with these 27, are there any of these that in your experience, people wildly undervalue or tend to not pursue in a way that's like disproportionate to the others? No, it's different per person. I, I tried to, uh, for one, I the story of creating the book is I dumped everything I had ever learned into this book over two years. <laughs> I was like maniacally writing for hours a day for two years. And my rough draft of the book was 1300 pages. And it like oh, contained wow. everything I'd ever learned in my life. And then I took two more years to edit it down to 115 pages. So now like every sentence you see in that book represents what used to be a whole page of ideas. I would like, I compressed it into a sentence. And uh, I'm so fucking proud of it. That's um, crazy. It was such a labor of love, but I didn't want to put out a 1300 page book. I wanted to put out, you know, a 110 page book. I don't like puffy books. I like succinct books. I love succinct writing with zero fat, you know, so there's not a single sentence in that book that doesn't need to be there. Your real question was like, are some of these overvalued or undervalued? I think it's in the world. No, it's, it's different for every single person. Again, it's different over time. So I already got an email actually just this morning, I got an email from somebody that read How to Live six months ago, and then they emailed me this morning to say they just reread it, and they're just like, oh my God, like everything changed in the six months since I've read this book. Like when I read this book the first time, I felt that this chapter was bullshit and this chapter was like completely true. And they said, now it's reversed. Now the one I used to think was completely true feels like bullshit. And now the one that I used to think was bullshit feels completely true. And so I think it's just at different times in your life, we value different things. You know, like just 10 years ago, I was on a mad adventure exploring, exploring of the world. And now here I am like a mostly full-time dad uh, in New Zealand, just completely staying put and not traveling. Hell, sometimes it's outside things, right? Like COVID suddenly changed so many people's lifestyles and values and your value hierarchy suddenly shifts with outside circumstances, whether it's a pandemic or having a kid or selling your company can suddenly shift all of your values. So um, one of the things I really love about the book is it gives you permission to be a bag full of contradictions. You know, because yeah. feeling like, oh, this is, I used to believe that this was completely true. Now I think it's bullshit. And when that reverses, it's easy to uh, be critical of yourself and judgmental of yourself and say, well, you wasted all that time thinking that this mattered and it doesn't. Whereas what this invites you to do is say, seasons change, beliefs change, ways of living change. And that's none of them are right or wrong. They just are. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I think that's, I think that's a good reframe. It also helps break you out of this tribalism mindset of having to choose a camp. Like the mm. current media noise of the last five years is very much like pick a political camp. Which side are you on? Are you red or blue? Decide. <laughs> you know, no as purples. if you're supposed to, <laughs> right? Like you're supposed to align all of your values with which camp you choose. But it may just be. You may say, like, you know what, when it comes to my relationship with my community, then I'm an absolute socialist. When it comes to my relationship with my uh, state, I'm a liberal. When it comes to my relationship with my country, I'm conservative. When it comes to my relationship with the, the rest of the world, well, I'm an absolute libertarian. You know, it's, it's not as simple as just picking one single camp. It's, you might have different philosophies that you wisely apply in a more nuanced level instead of oversimplifying and thinking you need to not just take broad brushstrokes, but take the whole damn can of paint and toss it over everything. I want to talk a little bit about balance. Something I've heard you say that I found to be really insightful is we often feel an internal conflict between our urge for stability and novelty because at times we need both mm. of these things. But as a, as a creator, it's easy to look at this dualistically and say, well, I can either have the stability of a job or I can be this full-time creator. And I, I see this conflict within people all the time of thinking they have to choose one or the other and they'll, they'll make these 
big fork in the road decisions to move <laughs> one way or another. So how do you think about balance between these internal desires we have, especially through the lens of somebody who I think identifies as an artist or a, a, a creative? Well, you know, I get a lot of emails, right? Like I, I like having a public inbox and keeping it open. I put about an hour a day into answering emails and I really like it. I like hear from strangers every day and it's so cool. But along with that, a lot of strangers kind of tell me their problem and ask my suggestion. And it's amazing that I get almost an exactly equal amount of creative people who have made that leap into being a full-time creator, but are complaining about a lack of stability. Uh, they don't know where the next gig is going to come from. Musicians saying that streaming them, uh, sorry, streaming isn't paying them enough versus the way that they used to sell albums for $15. Now they're getting, you know, a hundredth of a cent per listen. So I get a lot of emails from creators asking how to get more stability. But then I get a lot of emails from people who are stuck in some job or feeling stuck in some job, really wanting to quit and th you know, throw themselves full time into their, their creative love. So I think both of them are wondering how to get to the other side, right? But you know, if the person full of stability were to quit and be a full time creative, then they might have the same but opposite problem. Now it's like, uh oh, now I've I've got lots of creative output, but I have no stability. So I do think that the happiest people I've ever met on both sides are the ones who actually do both the thing you do for money and the creative output, the thing that you do for your intrinsic soul satisfaction. But most importantly, they're not depending on their creative output for their sole source of income, but they are taking it seriously. So they're not just doing it for 30 minutes before bed. They're like giving it a real effort. Like, for example, the musician example would be actually releasing an album every year or two, even though this isn't your full-time job, taking it seriously enough that you're going to write 20 songs and record 15 of them and release 13 of them put it on an album, give it a title, like go into a good recording studio, give it your best possible production, distribute it out through the various services so it's available everywhere, and tell everybody about it and go put your ass on the line and announce it to the world, not just hiding it, but not depending on it for income. Then your, your job can be something that you do for money that is paying your cost of living but not sucking your whole soul. So I think it's really healthy to have both. Or I should just say, my observation is the happiest, healthiest people I've met are the ones who are balancing both of those. Yeah, I agree. I, and I think sometimes we, as creators, especially if we are like full time on this thing, we often project that this business we're doing needs to fulfill all of our needs. You know, we're like, this has to make money and it has to be completely fulfilling and it has to make me happy 100% of the time. And right. we put all these things on this one thing and it's okay to have outlets that fulfill other needs for you that are not this one thing. I think we see a lot of pressure of people who are living their best lives on Instagram or wherever it is and thinking, huh. well, if I do this right, this can do everything for me. Right. And it's okay to have friends and loved ones that are giving you fulfillment and, <laughs> and happiness. and Right. You know, it's also maybe the problem is if you're talking about Instagram, for example, or, you know, related things, you're seeing just someone's projected persona, right? You're not seeing the real deal. So if you live in a place like L.A. or New York where you're where you get to know many people that are making a living as an actor or a writer or a painter or whatever, and you get to see like what the actual day-to-day -day life is of being a professional painter or sculptor or 3D animator, you see that going into it as a profession has spoiled their love of their art. You know, so right totally. now I live in Wellington, New Zealand, which is like the Hollywood of New Zealand and like literally walking distance away from my home is Weta, the studio that created Lord of the Rings and still continues to do Fun. Uh, 3D digital uh, effects for many Hollywood movies are all produced, you know, eight blocks down the road from me now. So I know many people 
that work at Weta. So many of them are so weary and miserable. They oh. loved doing their art. They loved painting or they loved doing digital design. And so like, oh my God, I got a job at Weta. And now they're working 12-hour days, you know, nudging uh a weapon this direction or trying to draw hair on a superhero or whatever, hating what they used to love because they made it their full-time living. It can, it can be the same with anything. You know, you want to be a full-time writer and suddenly, well, now you're getting projects assigned to you by editors who are paying you to to write about something you're not actually interested in because that's what you have to do to make it your full-time living. You might love it. I mean, for 10 years... 10 years? In New York City, I was a full-time professional musician. So despite everything I'm saying about the balance, I my balance only lasted two years. For two years, I had a day job, and I did music in my spare time. And after two years, suddenly, like, the music in my spare time was paying my full cost of living. And I was getting so many gigs, I had used up all my sick days at work to do the gigs. And so I eventually quit the job. And so, yeah, the last time I had a job was 1992. I was a full-time musician for... Another eight years after that until I started CD Baby. But to make a living as a musician, you have to say yes to everything. You have to pursue every gig. Somebody says, we need a jazz pianist for an art opening. I say, yep, I'm a jazz pianist. They say, we need a heavy metal guitar solo on this dance record. You say, hey, I'm a heavy metal guitarist. I can do a good solo for you. You need to produce somebody's record. You need to play on somebody's record. Somebody's looking for a singer for a jingle for hot dogs. And you got to say yes. Like, that's how you make a living as a musician. It can spoil your love of your art. But you might love it. Maybe you're the rare type that would actually love it. So I think having the balance at first is the way of finding out. We tend to think that balance needs to happen on like a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. What if you zoom out and look at the entirety of your career or like Mm. uh, productive work life and say, I just want that to be balanced. How would that change your decisions to say, well, maybe instead of needing to spend four hours a day with a, a paid gig and four day, four hours a day on my own stuff. What if I did two years working mm. a job that I didn't necessarily love all the time, but that bought me three years of doing my own thing then thereafter. I think, I think we <sighs> zoom too far in into the, the, the career timeline looking for balance sometimes. That's a great idea. I, I love it. My only caveat is you can't lose momentum. Momentum is so crucial and so underappreciated that if you were to completely stop creative pursuit in order to just do a day job for two years and let it suck your life away, you might completely lose your creative momentum or anything you had built up. So Tarzan swinging through the jungle is a good metaphor. We should all be Tarzan. If you think of how Tarzan swings through the vines in the jungle, he is holding onto one vine and then swings and has a momentum, and then he reaches to grab the next vine, but only when the next vine is supporting his weight, that's when he lets go of the previous vine. I love that. So whatever the next thing you're going to do is make sure it's supporting you before you let go of the old thing. Because if you don't, or if you don't grab the new thing, then suddenly, you know, the swinging vine might stop and you might just be sitting there at the end of a still vine and you've lost momentum. When we come back, Derek and I talk about what we can learn from professional musicians, some of the original creators. So stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, thanks for watching Creative Elements. This is a brand new channel here on YouTube. So liking the videos, leaving comments, subscribing to the channel, sharing the show, all that support goes a long, long way right now. It is all seen. It is all appreciated. And even though this is a brand new channel here on YouTube, I've actually been conducting interviews with creators just like this for more than two years. There are more than 100 interviews that you can go back and listen to with creators like Seth Godin, James Clear, Cody Sanchez, Tori Dunlap, even YouTubers like Ali Abdal, Matt Diavella, Roberto Blake, and Marie Poulin. I've actually created some playlists for you to help get you started, to dive into some of the best episodes that we've done to date. Just go to creativeelements.fm slash playlists. The link is also down below in the description, but you can filter episodes there by platform or medium. If you want to just look at uh, episodes with YouTubers or just episodes with Instagrammers, you can do that with those starter playlists at creativeelements.fm slash playlists. And again, the link is down below in the description. Hey, welcome back. Before Derek was an author, he was a musician. I've always been fascinated by musicians. They are some of the original creators and they've been following this model for a long time. So I asked Derek what we can learn from independent professional musicians that might help us as creators. 
The musicians that became huge successes were the ones that were doing something vastly different than everyone else around them. There was everyone else, and then there was this person that came in with a unique approach, a unique voice that was not doing what the masses were doing. I've seen a lot of your podcast episodes on YouTube and, and <laughs> read a lot of the transcripts, and there's often this pressure to do what others are doing. You know, like, hey, a lot of people are making 10-second-long videos on TikTok. Uh, a lot of people are doing such and such on Instagram. How do I fit in with that? Or even, you know, it's been funny to me over the last few years to see how podcasters, video podcasters have normalized, not just podcasters, like, let's just say YouTubers that talk into the camera, have normalized on this background of like the bookshelves and the plant and all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, this is what you have to do. But if you look at musicians, famous musicians, legendary musicians, they came out of left field, you know, they, they came at it from a completely different angle. And that's why they stood out. And that's why suddenly all heads on were on them is because they didn't fit in with the masses. They set themselves apart. And in fact, if I don't if you don't mind me pausing the musician analogy, if you look at the history of Starbucks, this is so interesting. Before Starbucks came along, apparently everywhere a cup of coffee was universally understood to be like 50 cents to 25 cents. 25 cents to 50 cents is what a cup of coffee cost. Anywhere you go, cup of coffee, 25 cents, 50 cents. Howard Schultz goes to Italy, gets inspired, decides he wants to make an upscale coffee chain. And so how do you compete against a 50-cent cup of coffee? Well, the way he did it is by making it so that people couldn't even compare it. They didn't even think to compare it because the environment was completely different. They gave them unique, even the reason, I think the real reason that Starbucks sizes are called like grande, venti, whatever, was because he didn't want to say small, medium, large. Wow. If you say small, medium, large, you can compare it to the 50 cent cup of coffee. If you see venti, grande, you're like, oh, it's just your brain starts to disassociate then making up unique names, you know, the, the frappuccino or even just introducing exotic mixes of coffee, whereas like everywhere else at every restaurant, every diner, you just say, cup of coffee, please. You know, that's like the joke, the early Starbucks joke in the early 90s was just like, I went into my local Starbucks and I said, just give me a damn cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, and and that's why they were saying that is because it like for decades, you would just go into anywhere and say, give me a cup of coffee. And they'd say, here you go, 50 cents. So how do you make yourself a $4 cup of coffee? You, you, you do nothing like anybody else is doing. Everywhere else that sold a cup of coffee for 50 cents has to compete against each other. Just like every YouTuber that's, you know, got a books and a plant and is just talking to this <laughs> and everybody that's just joining the, the crowd just blends right in, right? But then a musician comes out of left field with a completely unique style. Say that what like Prince was in the early 80s or where suddenly Nirvana in the early 90s or... Whoever it may be, you couldn't even compare them to what anybody else was doing. They were just in a completely different realm. I think we should learn from that. Whenever you hear people trying to advise you on how to fit in with today's current trends, you should be very wary of that because it's teaching you how to disappear into the crowd. There's, there's a conversation. Actually, the first episode of this podcast, I talked with Seth Godin, who I know is a friend of yours. And he does a really good job of creating new language for things that we understand and want to use new language for. Purple cow is a great example. Mm -hmm. You could go too far with that though. And he talked about this, like you could go too far with that. And then it becomes hard because people get lost. They don't know what you're talking about. But when you're, when you're doing these things where you're like, I'm going to be completely unique and do this thing my way. There's one, a risk of the timeline taking longer than you expect because it's new and people mm -hmm. don't know how to interact with it, how to deal with it. So I think, I think sometimes we think, well, if I just do something completely different, I will stand out. And so results will follow quickly. In my experience, that is sometimes the slower path, albeit it might be the, the more successful path as well. There's probably a mix in here of the thing we were talking about a few minutes ago with uh, the balance of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Letting your intrinsic motivation your artistic drive, be what it is and not trying to be all extrinsic about it. You know, extrinsic meaning getting the world to reward you with money and attention. So if you're doing something 
that's vastly different from everybody else. I guess it's assuming that you're doing it for intrinsic mm. reasons. Like you feel that this way is better. You don't want to just blend in. You feel that you can do it better than others. So that is coming from an intrinsically motivated point of view, but it can be strategic because you can believe that the that what you're doing is better, that some people need this, that other people, if you strongly dislike the way that most people do it and you feel that your way is better, you hope that others will feel the same way, that there will be others that feel that the main, mainstream normal way of doing things is wrong and your way is right. So it may just be that you're just less popular and that's got to be okay. You know, we we don't all have to capture 100% of the market. You know, what is it? 1% of the world is still uh, 70 million people or something like that. You can loudly exclude 99% and just be proud to just not be normal and just do what you do and understand that even if 1% of the audience comes your way, maybe that's the 1% that you're happier being among. You know, speaking of Seth Godin, he's got his thing about the minim no, minimum viable audience. That's it. Mm. Seth Godin talks about trying to target the minimum viable audience and not trying to please the mainstream. I think of that with not just my writing, but even my my books. You know, I mean, you know, How to Live is a weird book. And even just the fact of like <laughs> such like a plain cover. Like just, I chose for all my books, to, you know, I, I actually worked with graphic designers. I tried like 30 different designs with all of them. I just thought, I just want it simpler. I just want it to be like so, so much more core. And uh, I thought, God, that's so badass. Whenever I see a book with no, hardcover book with no glossy outside cover, it just looks more important. It looks more serious yeah. when you take away all the gloss. And I just thought, well, fuck it, what if I just put out books like that, you know? There's um, probably a and very I know, good metaphor there, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about that directly. But um, I know that I'd be alienating people by doing that and that these things would never be on a bookshelf in an airport attracting your attention from across the room. But that's okay. You've got to just decide, like, if this is the path you want to take, that you'd be happier reaching a higher quality 0.1% of the potential market instead of pleasing millions that you uh, wouldn't want to spend time with. I like that. And I, I like the idea of, hey, choose choose a path that is intrinsically interesting to you. Do things the way that you want to do it because it's the way that you want to do it. And speaking to balance again, find a way that you don't have to put financial or timeline pressure on that thing to give you extrinsic results mm. if you're doing this thing for intrinsic reasons. Yeah, and I think I think that's the trap a lot of people fall into is because they they perceive this this lifestyle that they want as a full-time artist, a full-time creator. And mm. for that lifestyle to be true, they have constraints. <laughs> they have fixed mm -hmm. costs and they think, well this thing has to solve for this problem. And so their, their decision-making kind of goes out the window of what is intrinsically interesting to me and how would I do this? And it becomes an experiment, a strategic experiment of, well, how do I solve this problem with this project? I was 20 years old when I moved to New York City and I got a job inside Warner Chapel Music Publishing, just like the heart of the music industry at Warner Brothers in Rockefeller Center, Midtown Manhattan. I got a job in the tape room, which is like this massive room that had one copy of every piece of music we owned in the library. And that was my room. I was the, the librarian. So it was right next to the executive's offices. So what would often happen is a rock star would come in to visit. And while waiting five minutes for the executive to become available, they'd come into my tape room. So I got to chat with a lot of rock stars. And what blew my mind is that these rock stars have a boss. Like, I think, you know, we think of rock stars as just being like the ultimate rebels. They get to do whatever they want. Everybody bows to them. But so often, they would be complaining about how the record label made them release a song they didn't want to release, or the record label wouldn't let them put out the song they wanted to put out, or the record label wouldn't let them work with the, the video director that they wanted to work with and made them work with this other one. And it was really enlightening, maybe disheartening, to learn that rock stars have a boss. But that's the trade-off they made when they kind of sold their soul to the record label, when they sold the rights to their music to a record label. They lost some of their autonomy, right? And so those people listening that have 
sold your soul to uh, Google SEO results or sold your soul to Amazon for placement or whatever, you've, you've taken a bit of that same choice that the rock stars did when they assigned their music over to a label. You've, you've given up some of your autonomy to try to please a corporate boss. Now that you're through this book, how will you decide what your next monomaniac focus is? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Actually, it's funny. I'm currently um, with no focus. You know, it's you're supposed to come on a show like this and say, well, let me tell you what my next project yeah. is. <laughs> but um, no, I just put out like the... Uh, the third edition, like 10 year anniversary of my first book that Seth Godin released called Anything You Want. I just put out the new version of it last week and I'm doing some programming. I'm doing some writing, but I don't have a next thing yet. And I love that. That's honestly what my book called Hell Yeah or No was all about, is that you don't have to fill your time with a bunch of little yeses. It's actually better to say no to almost everything and wait until something amazing comes along. And then the fact that you said no to so many little things means that now you've got the time and space in your life to throw into the next thing that really makes you say hell yeah. So yeah, right now I'm in the currently the time and space of just writing and programming and enjoying myself and who knows what's next. Living in a world of possible futures. <laughs> Full circle, well done. I hope you enjoyed this fun conversational episode with Derek. I really do believe he's like an unofficial philosopher for creators like you and I. I really recommend you check out his website where he reviews and ranks all the books he reads. He literally ranks his favorite books in order and there's nearly 300 books there. So if you're like me and you want to read more, that's a great starting point. You can learn more about Derek at Sivers.org or find him on Twitter at Sivers. Links to all of that are in the show notes. Thank you to Derek for being on the show. Thank you to Connor Conaboy for editing this episode and Nathan Townhunter for mixing the audio. Thanks to Brian Skeel for making our music and Emily Klaus for making our artwork. If you like this episode, tweet at me. Let me know at jklaus. You can leave a comment here on YouTube as well. And if you really want to say thank you, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening and I'll talk to you next week.